Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to another exciting live session of Avid Online. I hope all of you have been staying in, staying safe, staying dry, and have been tuning in to our online episodes and live sessions. For those who haven't attended an Avid Learning program before, a special welcome to you. Uh, please refer to the chat box for a brief introduction on the work that we do and also for more on our wonderful partners. Over the past few months, as this pandemic has made many people slow down, stay in and adjust to the new normal, we at Avid have done the opposite. We evolved our online presence and reach and we joined a growing number of institutions, organizations and other creative and cultural platforms to continue to spread the positive message of the arts and the boundless knowledge and inspiration they bring by going digital. Avid Online, our online digital further learning campaign was launched across social media platforms in, on the 1st of April, 2020. The objective was to enable our patrons and stakeholders like yourselves to engage with a range of topics across the breadth of the arts. The focus of this campaign was to keep members of the creative community connected, facilitate interactions and the exchange of ideas. Now we're well into our fifth month and we have curated and published over a hundred programs. In fact, today marks the 107th, a mix of live sessions and avid online videos. We are still going strong and feel so grateful to our speakers and experts who have contributed their voices thus far. And to you, our interested audiences who have embraced us in this newest avatar and continue to come back, tune in and learn with us, actually giving truth to our mantra that learning never stops. We continue to evolve this campaign by expanding our formats, reintroducing our existing IPs, and working with our longtime collaborators to present thematic programs and series. In this way, we bring you tonight's panel discussion, which is part of a specially curated thematic week of programming, Art 2020, New Paradigms in Education, Creation, and Identity, that explores the future trajectory of art, the evolution of the discipline, and the various trends that are emerging within the space. I hope you all have caught our thematic Avid Online episodes too this week. So now, without further ado, Commune India and Avid Learning present the third episode of Art Redefined Today, Identity 2000, 2020. Sorry. This is part of a four-part series that seeks to re-energize conversations around art and the future of art by engaging with emerging issues and trends that have been focusing on and taking the conversation beyond into the stratosphere of Indian contemporary art of tomorrow. I'm excited to introduce our panel of practitioners and experts, artists and activists, Durga Gaure, visual artist, Ritika Merchant, artistic director, Start India Foundation, Hanif Qureshi, and they will be in conversation with our moderator for the evening, curator Virangana Kumari Solanki. Welcome to you all. And for more about our wonderful panel, please refer to the bios, which have been posted in the chat section. They've also been emailed to you earlier in the day. Please note that the session will be about 75 minutes and will be followed by a 15 minute Q&A in which Virangana will be taking comments and questions from the audience. So please keep your question, post your questions in the chat box. Thank you for tuning in once again. Over to you, Virangana, and look forward to a vibrant discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asad, for the introduction. And thank you, Avid Learning, Community India, and all the three artists for being a part of this. Um, so the concept of identity is something that we've seen constantly evolve, not only right now, but over time. And it has become quite complex in its understanding, especially in today's context of a globalized and connected world. And um, when we talk about identity, there are constantly the boxes that we have implied to contextualize a fairly intangible form that we refer to as identity. And it's applied to people, it's applied to artists, um, certain areas or regions that we often end up skewing our understanding of identity politics, which is 
so individualistic that we cannot create these larger genres around it. But what we can do is perhaps have these reference points that we then take away from to understand each person as an individual and in this case, as each of the artists themselves. And um, whereas the artists, it's something that they constantly refer to their practice as a form of presenting themselves. And it's what in a way defines their identity. And the concept of identity itself is something that is quite integrated into how they live and how they create. And uh, from this personal self-questioning and reflection to collaborations and community-based responses, each of the artists uh, we have here will be sharing with us their practice. And they all have in their own way examined and defined their versions of identity through their visual practices. So they'll be taking us um, through short presentations of their work to help us understand each of their modes of expression before we move into a group discussion. And as Asad mentioned, for any questions that you may have, you could pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens or in the chat box. And we'll take them up towards the end of the session um, after discussion. Oh, we'll begin with um, Durga Gauri. Uh, Durga has um, looked at identity from very personal aspects and explorations of the body. Uh, their work has been defined by who they are as a person. And uh, Durga has previously worked with other living forms and has a very deep-rooted scientific understanding on aspects of survival and the body, which they now explore through drawing and figures, which uh, Durga has been looking at figurative drawing for a very long time, but now is also pushing the boundaries and exploring it through a series that they're now going to share with us. Um, Durga, over to you. Thank you so much, Virangana, and thank you, Avid, for having me here today. Um, all right. So before I show you my drawings, I am actually going to take a few minutes to talk about my identity. Um, I am an artist and sculptor by training, and I happen to be a trans, non-binary, gender-fluid person. Um, I was born a human being, and only after a little bit of time did I, was I able to identify myself. Gender identity uh, is so ingrained in my life and everybody's life. It's just more, it sort of my perspective towards it is a little bit different because my identity doesn't fit in any real boxes as such. So I pay a lot of attention to gender and its effects on me personally and hence how they affect society. So since a very young age, I would, you know, think about all of these things about gender discrimination, about you know, human rights, trans rights, uh, etc. And like how people had relationships to their own body, how they treated other people's bodies around them, what were the expectations of society when you were born in certain bodies, when you're born with a color of, certain, of, of your body, like what is the color of your body? You know, like all of these different things sort of affect a person's identity. And for me, being a trans, non-binary, gender-fluid person, these are words that I use to describe my human experience. And those words have become such a huge part of the work that I do. Being a trained sculptor, uh, I was really fortunate to have graduated from the Rhode Island School of Design in 2015. And I came back to India because I wanted to teach here. So as a, apart from being a sculptor, a trained sculptor, I'm also an educator. I perform in drag. I'm India's first performing drag king. And uh, I'm an activist as well. And so one in 2017 is when I came out about how I identify using these very specific words, which are, again, trans, non-binary, and gender fluid. So that started this whole journey of activism for me that has led me to this point now. And I kind of took a little bit of a step back from my artistic practice to figure out how all these things translate into you know, my artistic practice. So uh, Aisha, please, could you like share my images? Thank you. All right. So I started figure drawing eight years ago and I'm trained in classical figure drawing. Um, and honestly, this is a work uh, that I've been doing. This is, a, this is part of a series that I've been doing during the quarantine. Um, this person that I've drawn over here is their name is Lex Horwitz. We met on Instagram 
um they identify as trans masculine uh, with big femme energy and so when this is how they identify and they also say that they are very proud jewish a uh, person and they are a trans advocate they work for trans rights they are also an educator activist and model and uh, i found these images of them on instagram i saw them on instagram i wrote to them we became really good friends over this span of like two conversations and started to help each other with each other's activism and so i decided that i was doing this figure drawing series called remote figure drawing which was me basically uh instead of drawing from life i was looking at people's instagram posts and drawing from that so this is i mean like i'd made drawings of lots of different people that inspired me including people like madam gandhi uh there's another female musician called ambika nayak um then there are some of my drag brothers and sister there's also a by there who's a really good friend and then it came to lex i was like i've never drawn a body that is of a post of assigned female at birth person and that made me think about art and the context of body in art like you know we've had a long conversation from like the 70s 80s onwards to now especially with the gorilla girls etc like you know talking about how the the female body is represented in the art world but i'm actually trying to look at how post op trans bodies or even pre op trans bodies are depicted in the art world and so i'm trying to connect tradition which is attached to my legacy um as a child of to artists um and thinking about my my connection to institution which is very strong you know the institution of art and taking what is from legacy and from institution and tradition and connecting it to sort of the internet and forms of education now um so i should can you go to the next slide please so they can look at the next one as i speak so if you see uh this image is really interesting uh this drawing for me personally because the gesture in this drawing um uh, i don't draw i draw the energy of a person i draw the spirit of a person i draw the atmosphere they create and the environment they pull towards them how light and shadow falls how that translates the energy that goes into the image and out into the world then you know and so like this person was born uh assigned female so they were born with a womb eventually after puberty develop breasts and by the age of 22 decided that they didn't want their breasts anymore so this is an experience that i actually connect with very much because of my own identity and so um i'm planning to have my surgery soon at some point and getting to the decision was not just like difficult it's been a really lot of investigation to get to that point but i'd never seen a drawing a figure drawing of a person who was like that and so i decided to draw lex um so in this particular image if you see the gesture for me is very feminine the way the body is being posed is very feminine but the chest area i tried to create the sort of depth of something that was like present but is absent now you know something that is taken away um asha can you go to the last image please and here uh, again in this image uh, i know i know the images that have both this these images and basically like in this particular image lex was sitting in a pose that was kind of like like this and there was a lot of like calmness and very little shame in that body you know like really owning that body and i was trying to sort of depict that energy of just like being present and solid and fluid at the same time um so having looked at also all the figure drawing works that i've done in the last 8 years like these three pieces uh, i think they made me feel the most connected to myself uh, uh, be uh because uh, because not whatever it was just being able to connect to someone who has the same experience um or a par parallel experience on the other side of the world so yeah i think i have about half a minute left so i'm just going to conclude that uh <laughs> i set a time over and i don't worry <laughs> like <laughs> so i just want to say that um this is the first work that i have released out into the world um after graduating in 2015 and this is part of a 
of a long, long journey that I have as an artist. And I'm really grateful to all of you to include me in this conversation at this particular point of time um, with my drawings. You know, like I've been doing works in performance, I've been doing work in activism, I've been writing, I've been giving lectures, but this is about my work and I didn't want to show everything. I just want to show these three things which I started with. And there's a lot, lot, lot more that uh, there is to me and my hands and my heart. So thank you. Thank you, Durga. Thank you, Durga. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, I wish you could show more. I mean, I feel <laughs> I should have seen a lot more just now. But I'm going to come back to some of that later. Um, mm -hmm. Moving to you, Ritika. Uh, so, Rick, Ritika, your works have been biographical, between, living between two countries um, and two cities, I mean, Barcelona and Bombay. And uh, you've also extended your working with um, the migration issues in Spain and also working with communities through the series around Syrian refugees. So in a way, you've been dealing with this idea of individual identity as well as um, the idea of representing a community through your work. So we'll come back to the questions later, but I'll let you um, take over with your presentation. You're muted, Ritika. Oh, I'm, I'm here now. Uh, uh, thank you, Virangana. Aisha, if you can pull up the images, um, that would be good. We can start with the first slide. Um, so as a whole, my work, um, well, at least in recent years, has been exploring how objects can be markers of identity and how these markers and these objects, often in contemporary contexts, get completely reworked. And so I recently worked on um, a series called Ancestral Home. Um, which sort of invited the viewer to connect with an archetypal part of themselves. And then by doing that, it was a way to connect with the collective roots that we all have. Um, so the first couple of pieces I'm going to talk about sort of speak to our collective identities. Um, and I tried to work with symbols that would be really recognizable to a lot of people. Now, in this piece, um, it's the Nimbu Mechi. I think most Indians, most South Asian people would recognize that. It's something that... Um, is very prevalent in everyone's life. You know, you see it everywhere. Um, but what I found very interesting about this particular um, item or totem or whatever you want to call it was um, its contemporary use where it's sort of a thing to ward off the evil eye and people use it um, either to bring luck or yeah, to ward off evil um, is completely separate from how, from the original intended use of it. And so in my research, basically, I, I, I learned that um, this was used by travelers, like way back when, when people used to like walk through the jungles. And um, lemons basically mixed with water is just very hydrating. It's lemonade, it's delicious. But chilies were like the key thing. So basically when people were walking through the jungle, they um, would sometimes get bitten by snakes. Um, and then in order to know if the snake was venomous or not, they would eat some of the chili. And if they could taste the chili, it meant the snake wasn't poisonous because that means the nerve endings of their tongue were not affected. Um, so it was actually a very practical object, which now over time, like it's completely changed. But what I, I love about this particular, like the Nimbu Mechi totem is that if you see this in anyone's house, like if you see someone wearing it, if you see someone with a keychain, if it, you know where they're from. And I think that, that to me, it, it's something that's so interesting about um, just an object, what it can tell you about someone's identity. Um, okay, so you, we can go to the next slide now. Um, so this is one of two. There's this one, and Asha, in a few minutes, you can switch to the next one. Um, there are these two collages I did um, where I love making these collages because they are very meditative for me, and it's a really great way to graphically represent an idea. And so I made these two collages, um, which are titled Osmosis and Diffusion. Um, and they sort of deal with the idea of cultural osmosis versus cultural diffusion. Um, and cultural osmosis, social osmosis or cultural osmosis is when you basically find yourself knowing about things that you've never actually experienced yourself, which is something I think we've all experienced. Like you will know the plot to um, like a TV show that you've never watched. So you may know like the characters of a TV show you've never seen just because it's so much that's part of the cultural consciousness. Um, or like, for example, I've never been to Starbucks, but weirdly, I know the things that they, they sell. Like I could go in there and order 
and like use the lingo, but I've never actually been there, you know? Um, so that's an example of cultural, cu cultural or social osmosis. And then um, cultural diffusion is obviously much easier to understand. It's just basically the spread of cultural items such as ideas or technologies or languages between individuals. And so for me, basically living between two places, I've, I've really felt that, you know, I felt, I felt what it's like to like, you know, live that sort of cross cultural experience. Um, and for me, it's quite interesting because you realize that everything that you're exposed to or everything that even you're indirectly exposed to um, will in some shape or form shape who you are and it'll shape your identity. Um, so we can now go to the next slide. Um, the next two pieces sort of speak to my, so these, the three pieces that I just talked about spoke about identity, um, uh, like collective identities. Um, the next two pieces I'm going to talk about speak to specifically my own, own identity and my own history. Um, so this piece is basically a fantastic sort of visualization of the home I grew up in. I grew up in this art, beautiful art deco building in Bombay. Um, and it's filled with my mother's plants. And these are all the colors I sort of associate with, associate with um, being home and being in Bombay, um, which also the city as a whole has a whole lot of art deco buildings. And it's sort of a style of architecture I really associate with home. Um, and then the next piece, Aisha, you can, you can go on to the next one, um, is based on stories that my mom told me. Um, my mom's family's from Kerala and she would tell me these stories of these like wild Kerala women sort of just wilding out. <laughs> um, and I come from this like line of quite strong women on that side. Um, and it's interesting because I had, at the time when I was making this piece, um, I had been reading a lot about the ancient depictions of winged women. Um, and if you look at a lot of um, myth mythical imagery or folklore, you'll see that there's lots of images of um, winged women, but not winged men. And um, basically it was surmised that winged women in mythology represent power and freedom. And I mean, you, you can see they've been worshipped as like bird goddesses, like winged goddesses, witches, Valkyries. Um, there's lots of um, imagery of flying or winged women um, and they're linked to a whole lot of things. And I think it's interesting because to fly is basically to experience an extreme and profound sense of freedom and power. Um, but obviously because of this, questions always arose in all of these myths as to how you could control um, these women. Um, and I thought that, um, and you know, and also then it spoke to their, the ability of these women to escape the roles that they found constricting. Um, so in doing all of that research and then sort of thinking about these stories that I was told, I just thought it was kind of an apt metaphor to draw on. Um, and, and this is also an example of, of cultural or social osmosis again, because I, I didn't experience these stories firsthand. This is my memory and this is sort of how it's affected my identity just by stories that have been told to me and like sort of carrying on this tradition of like women in my family. Um, so yeah, so these two pieces sort of speak to my own history identity. Bear in mind, I'm trying to be like really concise with this because we have a time thing, but there's a lot more work on my website if you're sort of interested in in looking a little bit more, but I'm, I'm just going to go through this kind of fast. Um, and then the last two pieces basically speak to the shifting identity of community. And this is what Virang and I was saying before, where um, while I was living in Barcelona, it was like the height of the Syrian refugee crisis and sort of seeing, seeing what was going on with this community of people and observing it from the outside um, had a really, really profound effect on me. But it was it was in, I felt like I was in a strange position because obviously these are not my stories to tell. Um, and I wanted to be really careful about sort of not appropriating that. But at the same time, it was something that I felt quite affected by and, and wanted to um, make art about it, to, to deal with it and to be able to work, process it in some way. So um, Aisha, you can switch to the next one now. Um, so this piece is called Metropolis in Flux, and it's a representation of sort of the diverse and huge amount of people everywhere in the world, not just in the Mediterranean, um, that have been forced to migrate and leave their homes for a new life. And sort of this boat or arc sort of houses people of different backgrounds and ethnicities going on to different futures, but united in the same situation temporarily. And then the next piece, we can switch to the next slide. Um, so the, there's a myth um, in Greek mythology, which is the myth of the Fortunate Isles, 
And the fortunate isles were reserved for those who had been chosen to be reincarnated thrice and were judged to be pure enough to gain entrance to the Elysian fields, which is the final resting place of the souls of the heroic and virtuous in Greek mythology and religion. And I thought that this was just a very apt myth for what was going on at the moment, because during the height of this, there were all of these questions of who gets to enter a country and people were being turned away for a variety of reasons. And I just felt that this was a really apt metaphor sort of for what was going on. Um, and also sort of just to kind of end this, um, I think just growing up in Bombay and even now living by the sea, growing up by the sea, um, the ocean and the sea has like its own politics. And it's something I think that I've become more and more aware of as I've gotten older, um, just because this has been such a constant, like the sea has been such a constant presence in my life. And um, just thinking of water as this, I don't know, it can be this like terrifying thing, which, you know, is a passage for a really scary journey. But at the same time, it like holds the promise of sort of diluting conflict or, keeping alive the, the idea of a sort of better future at the end of it. And um, it, it's just, it, for me, it's a very powerful symbol. And yeah, so basically that's all I have for like this like brief overview of my work. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ritika. I'm gonna come back to that, but picking up from what you spoke about with your last work, um, I'm going to move to Hanif. And Hanif, you've been, I mean, as a co-founder of Start India, you've been working a lot with this idea of the collective identity for community and also the idea of the public image and identity with the creation of the art districts, which has been a constant um, thing you've been addressing through your work with Start India. But that alongside um, your personal practice where Say with Start India, you've let go in a way of your personal work, but it's also seeped in with typography because you've had certain projects where you brought that in. So this idea of the individual in the community and how the individual fits as an identity fits in with the community itself is something I think we could um, talk about once um, you've presented. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, thanks, everyone, for join the panel and uh, be here and thanks uh, for having me here. Uh, I'm going to share mostly uh, the work by the foundation, uh, the Start India Foundation uh, uh, and uh, the work which we do to kind of give an identity to the city um, through these art districts and then later on maybe we can talk about my personal practice. Uh, uh, you guys can uh, see the screen. Yeah, so I'm gonna like, uh, we have been active for the last six years and we kind of like, you know, we're working in densities and don't want to go into the numbers, but what I want to focus uh, mainly on is uh, the art districts. But apart from that, as a foundation, we try and do things in which uh, we bring art to uh, people on different, uh, with different projects. One of the project is, is art districts. It's basically uh, identifying an area in the city uh, working with the government, getting a permission for it, and establishing an art district where artists from India and uh, parts of the world can come and create art. Uh, and people, common people, have a destination to go and experience art at, at this large scale. Over the past six years, uh, these are some of the six art districts which we have been uh, working on. Uh, starting with uh, Lodi Art District in, uh, in Delhi. Uh, Lodi is a 1945 built colony by Britishers. Uh, and now it's a residence for CPWD uh, employees. Uh, it's a grid-like uh, format uh, where all the walls are identical. And it's, it may look like that we have painted the same wall again and again, but it isn't. And they are like all different uh, walls uh, in a similar thing. And this is what the map of uh, Lodi Colony looks like. Uh, currently, we have 55 artworks uh, in the colony, which one can explore by walking. And uh, so, yeah, for example, yeah, this is one of my uh, collaboration with George Ahil, who's an Australian artist, and we worked on this piece called uh, uh, I've, I've written Yaha, uh, which is like here, and she's kind of like written Must. It's kind of like 
abstract but she want what she wanted to say is like you know this must be the place where people settle down uh, and uh, so i'm just going to like take you through the uh, overall feel of like what the space is and i'm not going to get into the individual artworks but uh, the whole point of it is to kind of like let common man in this country also um, experience art at a scale which uh, they would generally not get a chance at the same time it's also we as a culture are not a, like a museum going country or a gallery going country uh, and these most of these works is now you stumble upon that and now since we started in 2015 there is like now it has its own identity and it's also like one of the places in delhi like must visit places in delhi to see and there's something which is uh, we're still working on uh another uh, similar art district we are building in, in hyderabad uh, it's called makta uh, art district uh, makta is a small neighborhood uh, next to uh, hussein sagar lake um, near people's plaza and it's kind of it's kind of like facing lake on the other side and uh, uh, this is like a a colony which is there uh, so here uh, the artist again have kind of like work from a uh, uh, local point of view of artist whenever they work here we uh, spend some time within space also work with community and uh, uh, create these works so it's also not like that we kind of like just take over a space but it's kind of like a gradual process which takes its own time to to build uh, and we work with local volunteers and local artists also to uh, to make that happen uh, in mumbai we are working on this uh, place called mahim east art district there's no there's no place called mahim east but if you google mahim east this will definitely take you to this particular patch which is kind of one corner of dharavi adjacent to uh, tulsi pai road this place is called shahunagar and inside shahunagar we have uh, uh, again we work with uh, local residents and volunteers who helps the artist when they when they come in uh, and uh, create uh, create these giant speed uh, artworks which are permanent within that uh, space and as you can see we are kind of like still we haven't filled the whole thing and we over the years we uh, we add one mural at a time uh, this is one of my uh, favorite uh, work by Guido van Helten in Taravi these are like the uh, b-boys of Taravi uh, he shot them and uh, painted them uh, it's kind of like merging with the landscape this is Sajid Wajid Sheikh uh, i'm just giving you a glimpse of the art district it has like more works so uh, another one which we work with serendipity every year to uh, infuse art in panjim and uh, these are some of the works from panjim this is by a uh, young indian artist called do and khatra mm, this is a uh, one of the cut out project we worked a uh, few years ago uh, where we commissioned uh, political painters from south of india who does like uh, cut outs of political figures but here in instead we kind of like put in uh, goan uh, figures across uh, across goa at that time is again giro van helten uh, by all these works now panjim is a small city and it actually becomes like a walking art gallery within the city so and it also kind of like gives uh, landmarks it creates landmarks within for people to navigate uh, and walk around the uh, city this is one of the works uh, by artist called daku with shadows we also did like a small residency we also uh, put some wooden signage back which is a traditional goan signages and this is how where my work also comes into play where i work with sign painters and the, the indian tradition of uh, sign painting um, this is a latest project in uh, in february just before the lockdown we were working in uh, in chennai and we did, we established this district called uh, kannagi art district uh, this is where almost close to 70 80000 people live in this whole complex this is by kashmira sarore from uh, this is ekil a chennai based artist and by uh, doing these works uh, when we finished the work there was like a strong sense of community uh, between people 
and uh, when the covid striked it really helped the authorities to communicate and the communities to also communicate with each other through this project uh, where they were able to control covid in this particular area very efficiently than the other areas and uh, it was kind of like art played a role in that to uh, to make it happen which is uh, something which is beyond our understanding as well so there's the last one which is called ukadama district in in coimbatore and uh, this is like just the beginning of uh, of that art district uh, this area called ukadam and uh, yeah these are these are uh, some of the ways in which we are trying to have art within the cities and uh, try and giving them a an identity a definite identity thank you anif uh, so i'm going to quickly move into i'm not going to sum up everything right now uh, but um, i'm going to bring up the first question and it would be great if you can keep this a discussion i'm not addressing it to any one of you um and for all of you are watching you can start putting in your questions in the q and a box so once you're through with this discussion we'll begin taking them up uh but looking at what all of you have done um there is um a lot of what all of you are addressing is to wider audience but by a, a very personal and subjective narrative or storyline in some way and as seen through your works is a sort of sense of identity and identification that each of uh, you is structuring around how we want to be viewed or how we are projecting something to be viewed uh however very often as i mentioned earlier that we are put into these boxes for others to give perspective to us from their viewing point and everything we see is informed by our perspective and is also imposed by our personal histories and our ways of looking which is not necessarily the other person's way of looking but there's also this um merging of how we understand things with um the world shrinking in some way but coming back to this representation of the other and within within what realm do we go beyond the limitations of understanding this identity and um, each of you has worked with the other in some way i mean from durga with the collaboration that you've been having online ritika with um, whether it's been through these um we, through these stories that have been passed on to you where it's this oral history that you're representing also the communities that you've worked with and honey what you just took us through so how would you think about representing the other and within what realm do we go beyond our limitations to understanding this identity and keeping that in mind how do you navigate the sense of responsibility that we need to carry on or carry forward with um, representation well i i mean at least from where i said i think you could only i think you could only tell a story that's your own um or something that you've maybe directly been told i i think it's i don't i don't know how to really express this properly but it's about giving your own authentic perspective i guess on something without necessarily appropriating and it's a really it's kind of a difficult line sometimes to tread um but i think i think it is I think I think it is possible if you try and stay quite authentic to how you feel about something if that makes sense. Uh you're on mute Durga. <laughs> Thanks. We exchanged last time you were on mute. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to mention that um I right before this I I just did a little bit of a, a small guest lecture for a dear friend of mine and I talked about I told the students to think about who is in power because the people in power write histories the people in power also collect art you know like where does there is a strong connection between like art and people in power or people of privilege and so when you think about history like you're talking about oral histories i want to talk about even written histories mm -hmm. like written history especially when it comes to people like me who identify differently you know we haven't been given the opportunities to write our own stories or tell our own stories and mostly our stories were written by other people so the point you made about appropriation and keeping that line really yeah. you know is yeah. something that i 
you have the streets open to express yourself if you have something to say i mean you can go out and say it and the walls are open and welcome you know uh, which a lot of people like find it like difficult to or kind of like oh i have never done it kind of a thing but i believe the walls like you know which carries political advertising always some kind of like messages as you are walking on the road there are like these things which you, whether you want it or you don't want it but it's there and at the same time as an artist it's also one can also take on the walls or take on these public spaces to express themselves obviously where there's a the, the responsibility also comes into that and all of that but at the same time being uh, anonymous also within this whole street art world they can like many things can be done which you know normally you can't and as we speak what uh, tyler in in bombay who, uh, in mumbai who's kind of like working right now uh, and doing a project which is uh, i find it quite uh, uh, quite amazing in terms of like what there's a sense of activism which is there and all he can do because he's kind of like kept his identity uh, secret as well um uh, which is actually doing this project with this called walk of shame and we kind of like asking people that who should kind of like instead of walk of fame is kind of like doing a walk of shame and asking people to like submit names of people who, who would go there and they like like first people they voted is anup goswami and it's like is is put in his name with like shit and all that and it's kind of like a yeah it's, a, it's and it's catching on and which i think is a great way to kind of like put people's thought into the street and in into uh, yeah i mean that that is one thing that um, like you said that the sense of responsibility and um, durga what again coming sorry coming back to you and hanif to your question and to what you said as well there is um, there is some kind of ownership we have to take of what we are putting out there and um durga for you it's also where you're writing history which hasn't been written so you also have to think about the future when you're going back to writing this um yeah. but um it's it's again and it and knowing that this is going to be critique because as um the sense of identity gets um in a way become something that people get uh you become used to reading uh reading a lot more about there's more history and more texts being written about it it is going to change to how you write so are there certain aspects that you're keeping in mind or is there something that is really strong in this of how you're moving forward in creating this along yeah. with the collaborations that you're doing Yeah so I'd like to mention that uh, I didn't have a space to talk about what I was going through so I started to write love letters to myself in third person to be my own best friend since I was 11 years old and so if somebody asks me and says like if somebody challenges me saying that this is not you know what are you even talking about I have like 45 books that I've already written you know what I mean like which is all my experiences and so I'm trying to collect these experiences from other people and can I quickly just show one photograph in context to this i have it open out here uh, guys this is lex this is the person that i had drawn so you can actually see like how many of us have seen images like this in the mainstream of a person who is so happy with their chest looking like that you know what i mean like and so i guess like uh, writing these histories and coming to that it's a point in time where a lot of non binary people are actually coming together and writing these histories together you know and um, like one of the biggest wins for us last year was merriam webster's dictionary uh, made the singular they the word of the year because it was google 327 times more than ever in history and that's because we've been speaking and we have been talking and we have been using our pronouns and we have been telling the world how we want to be seen and showing ourselves so representation doesn't just come from like my my image making with my hands but also i model and i put my face and my body out there continuously you know in contrast to the anonymity because the more i put myself out there the more people like me feel seen you know and that starts its own revolution 
So yeah, that I mean that's like what Ritika said about owning mm. your histories in some way yeah. and putting out all of that. But Hanif, while we were talking earlier, remember you mentioning this uh, consciousness of how, depending on districts that you were working with, you also were aware of the communities in certain areas before you put certain imagery out there. Yeah. And you briefly showed us a slide of your typography, which I'm again curious about how do you integrate that? Because maybe sign paint, I mean, sign painting is something which is, um, again, something you see in India, but then how do you adapt that to the regions that you're working with? So, uh, like before I joined art college in Baroda, I wanted, I, uh, I wanted to become a sign painter and I used to work with sign painter when I was in school uh, and get trained, trained uh, with them. Uh, but then when I joined fine art college and then I joined communication and advertising, what I realized that was the, what's the world of sign painter and what's like the, you know, the whole spectrum. Uh, when I st started seeing most of these hand-painted signs uh, replaced by a vinyl or a flex print, I did realize that soon in this near future, we will not have any of these hand-painted signs and everything's going to be digital like everywhere else in the world. Uh, the identity of India and also the landscape of India, like most of the urban landscape, the hand-painted signs play a very important role even when you're on a highway or you're seeing the trucks or like everything around you is kind of like painted. But, uh, but then this tradition, if the no more new sign painters coming in, it is kind of getting a little bit, uh, nobody wants to join because there are no opportunities in, in there. So what should we do? So I kind of like started commissioning sign painters to uh, design their own font uh, on a banner. And then we digitize and convert that into, into a typeface, which, which one can write. Uh, just from the, so when we make a typeface from the sign painter, sign painter also gets a royalty from, from, the, from the project. At the same time, what it does is that it documents and it also preserves that sign painter's style, which then some graphic designer in America can also use that aesthetics and work on a project which kind of like has a more of an Indian feeling to it. And so it's kind of like a way to give back to, to the society, but uh, also kind of like I yeah, have some kind of a, preserving it at the same time. Uh, and with that, I've kind of like doing more, uh, working with many more sign painters and that's how kind of like this whole type, typography comes into my, into my work. No, that, yeah. no, go there, yeah. I just want to say, I saw Haneev give an ink talk. He, he gave a talk at ink and I was around for the entire process. And I want to mention something about you with your permission. Please. Haneev spent a lot of time with sign painters learning and that has affected his practice so much. And the, if you could elaborate a little bit, I think everybody get a lot from it because the way you talk about it is so interesting. Like the way you sort of learned, you know, in the initial days? Uh, learning with sign painters in the initial days is, is not much fun. Uh, mm. To be honest, it's kind of like washing brushes and kind of like doing the flat paint and like he wouldn't even give you the brush before you have like, you know, some kind of confidence and that would take probably, you know, five, six months to get there. And it's a kind of like a, a lot of patience. Uh, you need that. And I admit that now as I'm kind of like growing older I'm losing that patience and uh, yeah uh, because now I see the uh, the possibilities more but uh, yeah it's a it's a old world uh, learning sign painter is also like a, uh, there's a guru and there's like a ustad and there's a master and you have to like work under them and it's like a that kind of a uh, and still is an unorganized sector with that's why we are also like you know it's difficult to uh, document and uh, figure what's going on. Thanks, Amir. But I think also just bringing it into what you mentioned about um, how we are heading into the future. Um, I'm going to come into my shift into my next question, which is about the future, but also currently what we are going through because 2020 is not going to be a year that any of us are going to forget very easily. And um, it's questioned and rejigged so many of the notions that we've had about sustainability and survival. 
that we've all been forced to rethink and redefine everything around us that in a way may have also made us rethink aspects about um, addressal. And uh, with the growing use of social media, particularly now, where so many, where so much of our perspectives of the world are being defined by the data that we're seeing through our screens or putting out there through our screens, it's um, something that there's this very strong sense of self-awareness. But at the same time, there's this merging of the physical borders, dissolving through digital collaborations and the idea of identifying oneself through a sense of constructed aesthetics, which is getting much harder to point out. So how has this been for all of you during this time? And what are the changes that you've observed for yourself or your practices um, during this period particularly? Well, for me, I mean, I've always sort of responded to what's going on around me. And at the moment, just being indoors and like not really being able to engage with the world that much has um, definitely forced me to look inward much more. Um, and then, as you're saying, like social media does become sort of this window because you can't really go out or, and interact with anyone. Um, but I've honestly found um, like Instagram especially to be super overwhelming. Like it's, there's just, people are on it like 10 times as much. And I think just because the world is in so much turmoil, like that's what people are choosing to express themselves. Um, but it can feel like a lot. So I don't know, it's, it's, it's a weird thing of like, you're getting all these perspectives, but it's really, it's like through the lens of social media, which is never really feels like it's real life. Um, and you can only experience it through um, just as a viewer, just as, as an outside viewer with no context. Um, so, I mean, that it's been kind of weird. I don't know. Do you guys feel that way too? Yeah, 2020 is a weird year, right? Yeah. Uh, I have a completely different experience right oh, really? now. <laughs> yeah, the whole you, like, world has uh, just taken up my lifestyle of like living by myself <laughs> and like working from home because... I said there is like literally no change in my life. I spend time on the internet. I go make my posts and what I do with my activism and I communicate to different people is through my Instagram and I go and I do that and I sit at home and I paint or draw or make things or write or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually for me been amazing incubation time and it's like Everything else is very distracting, you know, before this time for me as an artist. And, and now, because I'm not allowed to go out, uh, I don't have to deal with the dysphoria that I feel with people as much yeah. as a trans person. And I don't have to deal with the things that take up my energy as a trans person in, in India, specifically. And so I spent, I had such a prolific time over here. I've like made over 200 paintings in the last like four months, which is like... Something that I'm, like, 200 works that I'm really proud of. I mean, there's more, but those 200 works I'm really, really proud of. So I'm building, like, really, uh, I'm building towards my solo now. And so it's like, I don't know, it's when there are times of pressure. I, like, I, I, I don't know, I thrive. Because my life has been full of pressure because I'm in France and like pressure is something I've dealt with all the time. But when there's lots and lots of pressure, it's like I do so many more things to deal with it. So I don't think it's gotten in the way of it's actually helped my practice a lot more, mm. you know. So, yeah. And also coming to this point of sustainability, because Hanif, you brought that in with... Um, helping the sign painters and shift that typography into something digital. But just now, um, I remember you mentioning the other day that you've just started getting people out there who are doing things, but it's still something where, especially with um, public art and with street art, these are things that are not, and where art is not necessarily considered an essential aspect right now for many people. And for you working with communities and putting things out there, how has that been? It's kind of like this COVID has made it like the things which is good to have and things must have. And like this difference between the two and that art kind of like falls into this good to have kind of a thing, which the art and art world we call it. But I mean, we talk about art on the street. Uh, 
I think it's the time where we need the most, uh, where the there is like this whole cities are under this uh, mental stress, and I think uh, easing it out through kind of like making streets more positive, have more art on the street would really help. Uh, also, people. But that that's what we would like. But how is how is it actually being? It's actually been. Uh, I mean, uh, we painted a station, uh, Mahim station, because we also have this Mahim East Art District. We painted with the Western Railway the whole the whole station during the pandemic, in the at, in the middle of it, uh, with proper protocols and everything. And it's it's a bit hard and tough to kind of like uh, work uh, during this pandemic. But if you're looking at our practice that way, it's still you're still working in an isolation. You're kind of like still working on somewhere not like you know in a closed space. And at the same time. People say that oh, people are not going out, or people, but I don't think uh, it's that the case anymore. Slowly, our cities are becoming more normal. People, more people are out there, and I think when the more people are out there, there, sh- there should be like more art out there as well, to to kind of like say to yeah. I mean, we need to uh, come out and start something. Otherwise, we can just kind of like you know having these uh, mostly things. Digital, but we need to do something. I think now physical as well. So when we are mm-hmm. as we speak. Mm. No, and that brings me to one more question before we move towards closing comments. But um, is about how the world is shrinking and how we have these boundaries that are merging. And Ritika, especially for you working between Bombay and Barcelona, you've. Um, there is this question of um, identity and also this impose, and you brought up the Nimbu Mirchi um, aspect where it could be symbols that you identify with uh, through which you say, okay, this could definitely be Indian, but also these are, these are really things which everybody is now, if somebody comes here, they'll buy a souvenir. If you go to Turkey, you buy the evil eye souvenir from the airport. And um, that is shrinking in a way so do you find yourselves in a position where you will feel the need to identify with a certain aspect of um, nationhood or whether it's a certain aspect of identity per se in terms of um, an area specificity? And is that something that each of you feels the need to address in your work? I mean, we discussed this partly with the art district with Hanif, but um, with the guy and the guy, I don't know if that's something we can speak about. Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, I haven't really thought about it that much. I know what you mean by like now, like everything is for everyone, um, essentially, just to sort of boil it down. Um, but I think through my work, at least, I think my identity is pretty apparent. Um, so I don't feel like it's something I've needed to like hammer home. You know, I think it's, I, I would think that you can kind of see who I am through my work um, in many ways. And I think it's probably the same for Durga as well, because I, I feel that way when I, I feel like through your work, I've gotten to like, just, even just through following you online, I feel like I've like learned so much about like your journey and like, cause I've only met you briefly in India. Yeah, same, same. Yeah. And, I feel like I know you. <laughs> same. Yeah, exactly. And that's so funny how like that, you can really feel like, you know, someone just through their work and, how that, and I mean, I think in your case specifically, like your work is such an extension of you that um, uh, it's really allowed me to like get to know you that way. But I think everyone's work in, in a different way, even if it's not necessarily about your own identity in the way like you feel that way. I, I think you can still see a lot of the artist in their artwork, um, whatever it is. I mean, in Hanif's work, I can sort of see where he's coming from. So. I think just by virtue of the fact that we are artists, we do have that way to express ourselves and we do have that means of, I guess, asserting our identity. You know, for me, uh, it has been a two-part kind of process. One is to break away from a family identity because my parents are part of the art world. And for me, like coming into the art world itself was very daunting and there was so much pressure of performing. And then I got into RISD and then there was like, oh my God, you have to be the best, like now, you know? <laughs> and so it's like, there, there are like, there's, so when I came out, actually that was, uh, that was for me a way of talking about my own personal identity as a human before anything else. 
and now i'm talking more and more about my artwork and stuff like that and i have been talking about my activism and my identity and my drag a lot uh but during the pandemic you said that you know did you feel the need to connect and i did i actually started an archive where i i started an archive uh where i actually been connecting with other people like me who perform in drag and been drag into the fine art world more seriously because it's it's a, in it's like combining painting sculpture performance theater sound music like uh pop culture like there is so much that goes into actually finding the strength to compile all of that information visual information together using all the sensory information around it as well and then creating something that is uh like not identifiable in the larger context of things but it is identifiable in the context of gender identity and taking that into like the fine art world has been something that is my mission personally so i built this archive of over 100 drag kings throughout the world and i've been constantly seeking out and looking and building that archive building that archive and my campaign for my activism which is uh, hashtag the rainbow revolution is going to like turn into a brand soon and i'm going to start my own like drag king show which is specifically geared towards being a free show that some like someone who has no access somewhere just has access to the internet you know can see it and get inspired and by other ways of existing you know and so for me like my identity personally is not something that i have like during the pandemic moved into more it's it's actually been like okay i need to collect more people now and i need to like bring it to india i want to be the person to introduce because i am the first drag king in the country and there's only one other person who is got a womb who is doing drag and there are a few others who want to do it but they're so scared and so you know so to me i guess like that's my thing that's what's sticking me right now is like come on i need to do that sure <laughs> yeah you know getting to i mean coming back to partly what you spoke about memory and rethinking all of um the past but also that's in a way made you change how you're moving forward and um this this brings me to the last question we have about 10 minutes before we open to the audience but just as um to end with if each of you could speak about whether there's a sense of memory and nostalgia that comes in into recognizing this form of how you envision the future of um, each of your practices but also how you imply it to the sense of awareness right now and by the sense of awareness it's not only um about how we are but also recognizing whether it's just been survival or recognizing privilege because that's something that each of us has been forced to look inward into and regardless of how busy we've been it's uh, something that none of us have been able to move away from yeah. and how are we as individuals moving or collectives really moving into what change we want to see and how would we see that taking place is that something that you're thinking about in terms of the future trajectory for each of your practices uh um, can i go yeah yeah <laughs> uh i actually got really fed up of how uh, i talked about like history and power earlier and i got really fed up of how that like, artists are really not in power and haven't been throughout history in the way that power operates in the world and mm-hmm. so i decided that like moving forward into the future i'm actually going to run for prime minister in 20 years and i've been forming a cabinet with people anish kavande who's a curator and also runs pink list india is going to be my campaign manager so we've already had that conversation we're working towards it and he's smiling he's like yeah i see this <laughs> no seriously like when i when i talk about future i'm just fed up i'm just like you know what I just want to be in power I want to be in a position of power with the perspective of a trans person and the thought process of an artist while being really articulate and educated to make the changes that need to be made because you know people keep saying be the change you want to see and I mm-hmm. I really take that to heart and I've been doing that every day you know and so this is like there's like things that I do for one year things that I plan for 5 years things I plan for 20 years so this one's like 
20 year plan so i'm going to be running for prime minister in 20 years exciting <laughs> And we've already started work on it, which is very dedicated as yeah, well. Yeah, it takes that much. It takes that much. I mean, Modi started, we started listening things about Modi mainly in 90s, 90, early 90s. Mm. You know? yeah. It's a long time. It's my 20 year digital campaign, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and also because 65% of the youth right now in India is under the age of 35. So the voter base completely changes in terms of history throughout the world in the biggest democracy in 20 years in a major way. And so digital media is like so important right now. And also the millennials are the last people who actually spend time before technology becoming part of our lives in such an in, like ingrained way. And so the way people who are born after the millennials, they think very differently. And that's going to constantly keep changing. And technology is taking over. But how do we direct that energy, you know, is what I, I'm really thinking about. Because these spaces are delicate, you know, they're not monitored so much. And so mm -hmm. I think that this whole time for me has just been like, Think about the future now, okay? Like, you can't be living like this in this world forever. <laughs> As it is in for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Nitika, honey? Um, I guess for me, I think, well, my work, I, I, even when I look back on, like, my work now, it, it just feels like sort of this archive of things that have happened, I guess, in the world and how I've, it's a way for me to look back on just events in my life and events in the world and how I felt about them at the time. Um, but I think going forward, I guess, I think, I, I mean, I just hope I always have the freedom to just sort of express myself this way. I think it's really important to make sure that um, uh, we don't have to create art under censorship. You know, I think that's my main worry given the way the world is going and like the rise of like right wingers and like nationalism and all these crazy things. It's like, that for me is the biggest fear, just not being able to express yourself in um, a free and open way. Um, so I think that is something that I'm paying a lot of attention to. You know, I think it's something that we have to, it's a right that we really need to make sure we hold on to, to be able to express ourselves um, really. Yeah. For me to kind of like spell say the future of public art, urban art, street art, whatever you may want to call it, uh, I see that, yeah, that's just the beginning of, of that. And there's a, a, a lot more coming coming up. Uh, and it's also because whatever's out there, it also influences people to also do more. Uh, so if there's nothing, then, then nothing more, nothing would happen. But if there's something, then something else would come next to it and then something else. And then that's how it kind of like grows and it's kind of like contagious, I would say. So I see like more, more of these intensities having more art, more younger people coming out on street and painting on street as well. Uh, and yeah, uh, it's going to be, I think, much, uh, much more, much more action and activism as well. Because what this will also do is that what we didn't get into discussion about, like what is graffiti and what is street art, and there's like this whole vocabulary and the, you know, each has different tags and what it is. But uh, uh, as we do, as we more uh, do more, art in public spaces, there's going to be more activists and uh, will also follow, uh, which is happening the other way around. While in the West, the graffiti came first and then came street art. But now in India, it's going totally different ways where the street art is kind of like coming first and then probably following by graffiti uh, later on. So yeah, more activism, more art and bright future. It seems like we're all looking at a common future, at least. That, that's a good sign. In some way, we're looking for the freedom of expression and being able, and also the youth, which is so important right now, which you've all spoken about, to see that change. And I see that the questions are adding up. We've got about 20 questions. And thank you all for all of this. I'm going to start taking the questions up before I say my thank yous to all of you. Um, before, I think all of you can see them as well. The first is uh, to Ritika. 
Um, hi, Ritika. You have a very interesting way of presenting your thought process. Can you put some light on the way you conceive an idea before starting any work? Hmm. Um, well, usually my work is a, is a reaction to something that's going on. Um, but because I've always tried to weave in the idiom of myths through as like sort of a metaphor for what's going on, um, a big component of before I start painting is research. Um, so I do a lot of reading and um, I do a lot of researching and I talk to people if I need to. Um, and sort of that's how it starts. I also take a lot of notes. Like I am an avid note taker. Like I don't, I've always said like, I don't really sketch, but my sketch is my notes. Um, and then I will, then I'll start drawing. Um, so the next question is, how can younger artists, even students, become a more active part of the Indian art community? Uh, I'd say just start saying that I'm part of the Indian art community. And, <laughs> and <laughs> that's it. Like, you just have to say it yourself and then, like, everybody believes you. <laughs> but also, I think in a more, uh, just in a more, from a more practical angle or like a more tangible thing is um have an actual place where people can see your work whether it's an instagram mm, which yeah. is free or a website because i can't tell you so many times people have been like i'm an artist and i want to show you my work but there's no way for me to see that work so it's like mm. at least have have some place where like someone can go and actually like look at what you're doing because that will that's just a great way for people to A, see what you're doing, and you can also then share it with people who you want to be sharing it with, you know, if you want to be forming a community or like um, finding yourself in a certain community, um, you've got to have a place that people can go to to actually engage with what you're doing, whatever it is, you know, it can even just be a YouTube channel if you're like a performance artist or something, you know, just mm -hmm. there's tons of front platforms, yeah, just something. Yeah. But also, yeah, yes, the the you are, is also great, it's, it's a good way to start. Yeah. yeah, because being assertive is important yeah. because it's such an insular like community yeah. that like if you just assert yourself enough and just yeah. it just you become a part of it. Yeah, yeah that's true. Step and also visually, I think there's so much that is constantly being put out there that if you have a platform to showcase your work, it's um in this visual diarrhea pretty much that every day there's something new you at least have a platform where you can go to or keep yeah. putting out and there itself. yeah and as much as i have that massive love-hate relationship with instagram um it is a really good, great place to like find a community and i like i've met so many amazing artists through there and like kind of just become like online friends with them and stuff and um it is it's a completely free and like democratic platform you know um to meet people on and it's it, it is worth it to use it you know i know it can fry people's brains but it is worth it to use it and you can use it as little or as much as you want to but um, definitely use it yeah and Haneef, there's a question for you uh hi anif you have a spectacular style of expression very much illustrious do you face any difficulties while making the things possible in the particular locality any noticeable experiences and how do you preserve uh, these murals to keep them intact? Uh, by difficulties, mean like uh, if the subject is uh, before, now that we work in a very particular uh, areas and we know like what to, uh, what not to do, especially in terms of uh, whatever the message we do with making sure that it's not political, not religious, no nudity, no like, no offense to any community, all, all of these like things answered. Uh, that's from the art point of view, from the uh, permission point of view, yeah, we faced many challenges and we still do. Um, and there are like permission challenges. There are also like execution challenges in terms of the, the reachability of it and the many aspects to it. It's difficult, but I think yeah, the more you do it, you get better at it. And uh, the other ones about like preserving murals is we don't uh, try and preserve murals. It is whatever is out there in public space is kind of like ephemeral and it, it can, needs to kind of like go at some point and we are not so like fussy about it and we don't like call it a high art or whatever. It's just like mm -hmm. they're on street. So if it's not there tomorrow, every street artist who works on the wall kind of like won't feel bad if the next day that mural is not there because it's kind of like they're put in, I mean, once we 
to it it's there it's not uh, not to be uh, I, mean, yeah. I think that's also that sense of ownership. They have to let go because it becomes something that belongs to a larger public in some way, perhaps. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, you always uh, let go, and that's also the nature of uh, nature of street art as well. Hmm. Hmm. Next question: Which, um, how inclusive is the Indian art community? Is there a visible hierarchy in art? That is, how can we distinguish between good art and bad art? That's. A, I mean, I was say, there's not anything as good art and bad art, really. I think. I mean, I just feel that honesty is the most important thing. And when you look at something where you don't want to see plagiarism, you want to see something that's honest. It's about you, and that's something I think all of you spoke about as yeah. well. Yeah. We're talking about the Indian art community in the context of the artist, or context of uh, everything else. It, I think just as a whole. Maybe. As a whole. Do you feel that it's? I don't know how to answer this question. A part of me feels I like don't, it's not inclusive because it feels quite rarefied at times. Um, but I, I don't know. I feel like I don't have enough perspective on this to to answer this question properly. I don't. I personally don't think it's inclusive. Uh, yeah. I think that uh, there is a the uh, sort of Indian mentality of like Lokya Kahenge sort of seeps into the art practice of every single artist, and me too included. Like yeah. you have to really think about like how you're putting your work out. At least I, I mean, I, I can't speak for anybody else, but I yeah. do. I've seen other artists closely as well, and I find uh, a lot of times. People like on their tiptoes, tipping around the issues, but I don't think it's inclusive. And I just, yeah, <laughs> long way to go. The, the lack of it being inc inclusive, or the fact you feel like there's a lot of judgment within the Indian art community, because that's two different no, things. I, no, like when I, when when the word inclusive is used, right? Like yeah. uh, I can, I mean, the, when I hear the word inclusive, I have, I think about like. As a trans person, I think about how many trans people have I seen in a gallery opening. Yeah. Very rarely, maybe like one in like ten years. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll see who is openly like that. I remember when I was a kid. Every time I would go to a show with my parents, I remember what show I saw someone who wasn't supposed to be wearing a sari wearing a sari. I remember mm -hmm. women who had chin hair when I was eight years old who showed up. What was their name? What show it was? Who's yeah. who, what? What artist was the? What conversation I had? Like. I remember these when when you say inclusive, the word inclusive, it doesn't like just talk about like I think it just doesn't talk about the artwork, but also like how we bring in people. Bring in know? people, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would agree with you. I mean, you don't. There isn't that much diversity. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I do think now, especially with the younger generation, at least of gallerists, um, that is slowly changing. Mm. Mm. Um, not, I don't think it's like a lost cause at all. Like, I think that like, oh, no, not at all. yeah, like I think change is coming. And even just a, a practitioner like yourself, just being so visible is like a huge thing, I would say for like um, a lot of maybe younger artists who, who aren't that visible or unable to for whatever reason. Um, but I do think things are changing. That means that, as I, I mean, I would agree with you. I don't think it's historically such an inclusive space, not even just for trans people, but I mean, just for a variety of like different minorities. Um, but yeah, I think with our generation, change is definitely coming. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and there are new democratic platforms. I mean, Art Train India, for instance. They're, I mean, they're, we're just opening up ways of um, people putting themselves out there without having the need to have somebody represent them or help them put their work out there itself. Yeah. So that's again, I think, where people are taking ownership of how they're put, they're really representing. Their yeah, work and I think themselves. that's such a good thing also because ultimately there's only a certain number of galleries and they can only represent a certain number of artists but like there are so many more like amazing artists who just maybe just haven't found their way there and I think it's really good that there are so many platforms now that are popping up um, to support that because like there needs to be I think I've always said this, like there's room for every artist, you know what I mean? Like for every like artist there is space that, and like whether it's about maybe making that space for yourself 
um, or finding a non-conventional space to to inhabit, um, there is space for everyone. We just have to yeah. sort of work on also engaging with those alternative spaces, I think. So there's one more question for you, Hanif. How do you connect with hand-painted signboards across different cities and what can be done to preserve these dying art practices? Uh, you look for uh, any hand-painted sign uh, in the city and mostly the sign painter somewhere in the corner would have signed it. And nowadays they also write their uh, number. I was on like, like I was traveling for the past like 10 days in Rajasthan and all I was doing was actually clicking pictures of these signs where the sign painters write and write the number so that now I can call them and say that I want to do this work and they would do it and they would send me. Uh, so by basically spotting hand painted signs and finding the sign painter is the best way to, yeah, you get the, get the sign painter's contact, very easy. I'm going to send you a bunch now that I know this. I'll keep uh, an eye out. They're out there and they, now they want work also because earlier when I used to call and ask for banner, the, most of the time they would say, no, no, this, uh, we don't have time, this, that, whatever. This pandemic is giving time to everyone. They're also saying, yeah, we will do it. And which is, I'm like, I'm, it's kind of strike me that, yeah, it's actually I should now start calling them again because this, they will do it now because earlier they did not have time. Now they have. And we all have actually. Mm. So. There's one question from some, um, I think this is addressed to all of you. As a society, we have, um, sorry, as a society, we know that cultural identity influences personal identity. When it comes to acknowledging who we are with the influence of culture, how do you discover the originality of your being? Through your roots and through your like, I mean, that's one of the way to do it. I mean, many ways you can do it. I mean, it's a vast question, but yeah. Yeah, I would say for me personally, it's been looking in the mirror and not being able to identify and then just trying to identify what makes me me, not in a physical sense, because when I look in the mirror, like I... The reason I can't recognize myself most times is because I look beyond what I see. And so that's been my process to think about what makes me me. Um, I think for me, it's definitely through like either oral histories or um, just like reading things. Um, I, think, I think documented history has been like really big for me in terms of like looking at my own identity. But I, I've also realized that there's lots of un undocumented things and um, it's in like trying to find, like looking through those cracks that you also find things about yourself and about your history and about your own identity. It's not always all out there ready for you to like find on a plateau. You know, you have to sometimes read between the lines of things that maybe people have not necessarily been able to document for whatever reason. Mm. There's one more question. I think Hanif, you've already answered this um, about preserving paintings from buildings. Um, okay, there's a next question about, again, Hanif, to you. There are lots of questions for you. <laughs> have you. Have you done any survey on the response of neighborhoods where artwork is displayed as, mural, as murals? Uh, this person is from California, Oakland, which is famous for murals in its neighborhoods. Yeah, so we have done. Uh, we have kind of like worked with Lodi Colony uh, and uh, yeah, recorded responses of the residents and what do they see before and how like how it has changed and there's like a proper survey which has been done on it from all different point of views, from the safety point of view, from the mobility point of view, from you know, people coming and visiting and how the economics of it is changing it. Uh, how the markets are getting benefits from it. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of like uh, uh, work done on ground uh, with this as well. And yeah, mostly positive. And another question again for you, honey. <laughs> well, I'm going to combine the next two because they're both for you. Um, I find street art very fascinating. However, with the weathering of walls, I suppose the works don't last. So have you gone back to the same walls or communities and worked again? 
are people as enthusiastic the second time around also can you share a bit about how these wall works bring about a change in their lives or the way they see art or the world around them and where do you see a indian calligraphy in art uh to answer the first question about uh, uh, the the surrounding and what it is i mean like i wish when i was young i would probably like you know born abroad probably like born in a space where i would see this like larger than life paintings it would really change my imagination completely uh, and there are kids who are living in lodi colony right now they kind of like have obviously have a different way of looking at things because they kind of like so used to looking at this whole uh, art in each of these streets so it's a uh, it's very different um we don't go and paint the wall again at the second time or something it's kind of like whatever is there is there so far that's what the case so not uh, getting into that uh, to answer the where do you see indian calligraphy in art uh, indian calligraphy mostly uh, where we see talk about kind of restricted to devnagari uh, mainly and the kind of like also this marathi school of uh, calligraphy which kind of led by people like achut pala and like so on where there has been a kind of like one sense of uh, calligraphy so there's also like uh, there's urdu calligraphy so also the thing with india is languages and we have so many languages and so many scripts and so many of these things that like we have a there is like a, i don't know if there's any uh, uh, professional uh, calligraphy body out there but uh, at one point calligraphy was dipping and now it's kind of like slowly coming back to the new avatar with the with the new tools and you know so yeah that's uh, it's coming up but still i would say not there as yet okay um then um there's another question from jonathan i am a new artist from malaysia indian ethnic origin i always think about what art i am putting out I wonder how important it is to determine one's identity at the outset or just let it remain fluid as we go along as artists and is there also an expectation of artists to have an identity which shows in their art There's an expectation I think it will just automatically come out if you're making art that's authentic to you I don't know if you it's something you need to like think through and be so conscious of at least in my experience but it, uh, yeah um i want to say something about this um was something that actually helped me a lot when i was in college one of my professor jane south artist based out of new york uh, i'm going to quote her she said this to me she said pay attention to what you pay attention to mm-hmm. and that really helped me it was like Oh my god like what do i nat- what is my natural affinity i have and and for and why and as a student i realized my natural affinity was towards biology and nature and so my forms and my movement and the lines all of that comes from studying so much biology and stuff like that and I ended up taking like and then going in directions of like taking care of 26 species of marine life when i was a student as well so i would do all these things that would naturally i'd be a, like happy to do but then also pay attention to them knowing that they were going to translate into my art at some point even if it wasn't immediate you know so. and also i think our identity sort of change over the course of our lifetime i mean as we go along and i think that will also be visible in your artwork you know depending on your life circumstances and what's changed um that will be visible so i think it's I think it will automatically I I yeah I, I as you were saying I mean it is paying attention mm-hmm. to what you're paying attention to but that stuff will just automatically kind of come out into your work. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. I see Asad's come on which I think <laughs> they're nearing the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a whole bunch of questions to go. <laughs> so it's like okay I'm going to get ready for my closing speech here are my notes. <laughs> So I can see plenty of questions but I think we're going to have to do a share them with the artists and um, hopefully we'll be able to reach answers to all of you. Uh thank you very much for avid learning and commune for hosting all of us this evening and thank you Durga Ritika Hani for 
your wonderful presentations and for making this such a fun conversation. Thank you for having us. Um, this was um, a very enlightening conversation, actually. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, yeah, guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our wonderful panel for this engaging discussion. I mean, we've had a, 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 a couple of conversations before, and I feel, uh, you know, we wish we had more time to actually see their work. But unfortunately, we were trying to compress a lot in this one and a half hour time slot. Uh, a special thank you to our partners, Commune India, uh, for generously collaborating with us and to you, our, our participants, uh, for taking the time to attend this session. And, you know, just stay tuned for more exciting programs from Avid Online. Our next live session is Thursday, which is on documentary film festivals and social change. We have Chris McDonald, uh, who's going to be in conversation with Nandini Ramanan. Um, and to find out more about what we're up to, just follow us at Avid Learning or check out our website. Uh, thank you all again, once again, for tuning in. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay dry. And remember that learning never stops. Thank you very much and have a good night.